question is, why aren't Christians seeing what's going on? They're lackadaisical. They're distracted. They're distracted. Let me ask you something. Why aren't you a brain surgeon? Say that louder. Because she didn't go to school, for those of you listening. The reason that maybe some of you listening are not brain surgeons is because you didn't go study it. If you really wanted to be a surgeon, if that was your life dream, you would knock down walls to attain that dream. We do that, don't we? Some of us want good looking yards. And so we're out there every day and we're mowing and we're pruning and we're trimming, right? And we're fertilizing and we're watering. Why? Because you want that nice yard. Some of us want a big house. And so we try to get the best job we can get and we study and we learn and we do as much as we can. We do everything in our power in order to make enough money to have that big house because that's, that's our life dream. Some of us want to have the, the best kids, right? And so you're that mom and you dress up that little girl and you go to those little pageants. And why? Because you want that notoriety. The reason the church isn't looking is because they don't want to be Christian. Quite simply. Because if Christians really wanted to be Christian, notice what I'm saying. I didn't say Christians being Christians. They don't want to be Christian. You can be a Christian and not be Christian. Am I making sense? You can be an American and not be American. We're seeing that more and more and more and more every single day. And we are loaded, churches are loaded with Christians that don't want to be Christian. Because if you want to be a brain surgeon, you study to be a brain surgeon. If you want a big house, you study to get that job that has that big paycheck to give you that big house. If you want the best kids, you study how to be a great parent. Because none of us know how to do that on our own. So you study and you learn and you search. You don't find a school that gives you a passing grade so that you get a degree and then no one will hire you because you still don't know what you're doing, (laughs) right? You go to a school that's going to teach you to know what you're doing so when you get out, you're the best at what you do. So you don't go to a church that just entertains you and makes you happy every week. Mm -hmm. If you don't feel challenged when you leave your church, find another church. Because if you don't feel challenged when you're at school, you need to find another school. You need to find one that's going to teach you and train you. And the reason that Christians aren't seeing what we're seeing is they're not looking. And the reason they're not looking is because they don't listen when Christ said, when you see these things, look up, period. Not a suggestion, not a question mark, not a, well, it might be fun to look up and just see what's, no, look up because your redemption's close. And if your redemption's close, that means the tribulation is coming. And if the tribulation is coming, that means eternity is coming. And if eternity is coming, those people that don't know Christ as their Savior will spend an eternity in hell. And if you're truly a Christian and you really believe in what the Bible has to say, you would spend every day of your life trying to find out more and more and more and more. Because you know what? What we're finding in this class is a Bible written by many people over thousands of years, different books, different themes, different time frames, different backgrounds, some written by lawyers, some written by tax collectors, some written by doctors, fishermen, all different walks of life. And never does this book contradict unless you don't dig to find out why it looks like it contradicts. You think science never contradicts itself? What do they do when science contradicts itself? They keep looking. They keep digging. They have been digging 
for over 150 years to try to prove evolution is true, and they still have not found fossil proof of it. Still, even though Darwin says, if you don't find tons of fossil fact, my theory is wrong. Says it in his book, read it. Oh, I didn't know he wrote that. It's probably why you don't know why God wrote a lot of stuff too, because you didn't bother reading it. Probably why you don't know what the other people believe that disagree with you, because you never bothered reading their books either, did you? You're not a Christian who wants to be Christian. You're a Christian maybe that wants to escape heaven. I mean, hell, sorry, Christians don't escape heaven. You're a Christian because you want to go to heaven. Maybe you want to be there because your parents are going to be there or your children are going to be there. But you're not there because you love God and you love Christ. You're not a Christian because you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You're not a Christian because you want God's power to witness. You're a Christian for all the wrong reasons. Same reason people are American for all the wrong reasons. And so why do we look at the weekly updates? Because we're commanded to. That's why I do it. That's why I look through them, so you don't have to. But you should be. You really should be. Because I'm not the only one commanded to look up. We all are. If you're a Christian living in the end times, you'll know it. When you have, and listen to me, I watch all kinds of different things to get the weekly updates. I watch YouTube, I read the AP, I read CNN, I read MSNBC, I read Fox, I read BBC, I read Al Jazeera. I get into everything I can get into, why? Because if I look at it simply from an American perspective, we're not getting anything. We're getting very little. You go to the foreign press, you go to Al Jazeera, you go to Israeli news, you go to Jordanian news, you go read, you know, what's going on in France and, and Germany and all these other nations, and you're going to find out all the things that the Bible tells us are coming in the end days are here. They're here. They're just getting worse and worse and worse. They're all here. So this week, I wanted to do a shorter version of the weekly updates because I want to spend a little more time teaching this week. And I found one thing, and then I stopped looking. Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 through 14 says this, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw, and listen, a lot of times we don't pay attention to the verses following the judgment. And we just looked at this judgment. We just went through the, the bowl judgments, and this is the sixth one. And listen to these verses, and I find these verses interesting. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now, the great battle or the battle of the great day of God is speaking about the battle of Armageddon. This is the river Euphrates being dried up so the armies of the east can march into Israel, okay? And then surround Israel right before Christ with us returns says it is done, wipes out the enemies that are surrounding Israel, and then we go into the millennial kingdom, okay? So, what's that have to do with the weekly update? Originating in Turkey, the Euphrates flows through Syria and Iraq to join the Tigris, which empties into the Persian Gulf. The 1,700-mile-long Euphrates is the main source of drinking water as well as powering three hydroelectric plants that produce electricity for about 3 million people in Syria. This year, Syria is currently facing its worst drought ever. There's that word again. Two dams in northern Syria, which are fed by the Euphrates River, face imminent closure, which could leave about 3 million people without any access to electricity. 
The water level at the Tishran Dam has dropped five meters and is currently about, listen to this, 10 centimeters. You heard that right. <laughs> they said centimeters. You know how big a centimeter is? This dam is 10 centimeters above, quote, dead level when the turbines stop producing electricity. According to reports from Damascus, Syrian authorities are, concerning, are concerned about the drying up of the Euphrates River, the country's longest river. This would result in a humanitarian crisis across, across the country. People in the region are being deprived of drinking water and agricultural water as a result of rising temperatures, decreased rainfall, and drought. You should see pictures of the Euphrates River. I couldn't download any, and that's interesting because sometimes online you can, you can click a picture and sometimes you can't, they protect them. Everyone I looked at that I tried to find, I could not find, I wanted to bring a picture of the people standing in the little puddles of water that used to be the Euphrates River. Puddles. Trying to rescue the fish before they all die. The Euphrates River is drying up. Gog and Magog armies are already together north of Israel. We've talked about that a lot in this class. You've got Apophis, which could be Wormwood, spotted by NASA, already saying it will be within 1,700 miles, yes, lower than some of our satellites, will pass us in 2029, lower than our satellites. We have the cashless system, the Fed of the United States announcing they want it to be totally cashless by 2029. Israel became a nation 70 years ago, a little over 70 years ago. We are told that, it, that the last generation, that would be the last generation before the end of the world, before Christ returns. That was over 70 years ago. Psalms tells us that a generation is 70 or 80 years. 1948 was when Israel became a nation. 80 years is 2028. According to scripture, we have till then. And we're not looking up. Instead, we want to go to a place that we can have the best coffee, eat the best Danish, have the best entertainment, and hear some guy that's never going to challenge us. And then pat ourselves on the back and say, aren't I a good Christian? And then we go home and we go to that job that we worked so hard to get to have that big house. And we work so hard, we never see our kids, we never see our spouses, we never see our family members, and the people that we know that are unsaved are just going to have to stay that way. And we wonder why God says to the church of Laodicea, you think you are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and don't realize that you are wretched, poor, blind, naked, and I want to spit you out of my mouth. It's not an accident when the book of Revelation says that in the tribulation during the sixth bowl judgment, when the river goes completely dry, that three demons will be released, okay? And those demons are going to bring all the nations to hatred, a boiling hatred of Israel so that they will gather. But what does Jesus say in Matthew 24? You are going to see birth pains. You're going to see these things happen and get bigger and bigger and stronger, like we've seen with earthquakes and droughts and floods and all the rest and society. And guess what? Now we're watching the Euphrates River dry up. What more does God have to show us? 
And part of the sixth seal, or I'm sorry, the sixth bowl judgment, are these demons that are released. We are told also in the book of Revelation that demons will be released during the end times that have been held in captive for thousands of years. You wonder why society's breaking down? You wonder why mor morality is breaking down? You say, well, I just don't think you should have biblical morality. Well, let me ask you something. What is biblical, biblical about not murdering? What's, what is only biblical about not breaking into your neighbor's house and stealing what they have? What is just biblical about lying about somebody and bearing false witness? Those aren't just biblical morals. But we took them out of our school. And we took them out of our courts. And we said that it was wrong to tell people you shouldn't murder and you shouldn't steal, and you shouldn't lie, and you shouldn't want what your neighbors. Think about it. Because the world was so afraid that those, those laws happened to be first in this book that they must be bad. Well, America, how's that working out for you? <laughs> How are we doing since we pulled that out of the schools? Israel become a becomes a nation. Society begins to break down. We're told that's the last generation. The church was told 70 plus years ago, you're the last generation. Look up, because you're going to start seeing stuff. And when it gets really close, it's going to explode. And it has done that. It's done that to the point now where unsaved people, worldly people, fleshly people are using terms like apocalypse, biblical proportions, never before seen biggest that we've ever seen how many weeks have i read weekly reports and that word always comes up worst drought in history worst earthquake in history worst worst volcano eruption that we know of in recorded history but yet what are we doing So we get to this point, and, and this, is, this is something that I've said before. Scripture is not an easy thing to understand all the time. But neither is a textbook on brain surgery, is it? But people study that. If they want to be a surgeon, they'll go be a surgeon. What about this book? Nobody reads it anymore. I bet you if we did a poll in this room and I said, how many of you read your Bible every single day this week? I'll bet you that none of us would raise our hand. Okay, good. I'm glad a lot of you did. Now, I did, but I don't really count it because... There was a day that all I did was my daily verse. And so I couldn't honestly say, did I read scripture? Yes. I don't count that. You know why? Because somebody gave me to that. Somebody gave that to me and said, read this. Every day it comes, it pops up, it's an alert. And I'm not saying don't do it. Sometimes that daily verse triggers me because there's, there's also a little thing under it that says read entire chapter, and I click on that, and that's where God feeds me, okay? So I'm not, in all scripture, none of it will return void. So please don't leave here and say, oh, Ed says, if you can't read scripture for a half hour, then don't read it at all. That's not what I'm saying, okay? What I am saying is this. When you read a textbook... For an, you get an assignment in church, right? So you read your textbook assignment. Do you just fly through it? What if the teacher says we're having a quiz next week on this reading? Are you a little more careful how you read it? 
I was. Those of you that remember school, I remember school. School was tra traumatic for me. But I always read it really well. Why? Because there was a quiz coming. And I would take notes. And I write the important, the stuff I thought was important down. What's amazing was the stuff I thought was important almost never was what the teacher thought was important. <laughs> and so what I wrote down and studied, <laughs> it wasn't what he wanted or she. We have a teacher that lives inside of us. You think it's a coincidence he's called a teacher? because we're supposed to want to learn every single time we read this book. And when I say, and I guess I should be more specific, when I say, did we read the Bible every week, what I really should have said, did we get something out of this book every day this week? Because we should. And I don't think we do every week, consistently. And I think Christians in the past did. I think this book was more important to them. I think this book was more important to, to the church as a whole. This book certainly was more important to this country. They etched it in marble on the walls in Washington. You think there was supposed to be separation of church and state? You need to talk to the founding fathers who put it in marble or granite all over D.C., all over our courthouses, all over this country. It's everywhere. So I'm sorry, but that argument doesn't fly. So we are living in a time where we're real close to seeing the Lord return. <clears throat> we know this because of the signs that he's been giving us. And one of the things that we looked at last week, we are in chapter 19 of Revelation. One of the things that we got to was the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we read through it pretty quick, and we talked about where we are, and that's pretty much all we did, was where are we during the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we pointed out that there was a multitude of people, started in, in verse 6, multitude of people clothed in white linen, fine and clean, and it says that that white linen represents the righteousness of the saints. We're in heaven. And what's going on in heaven? Okay. And my argument was that we're in heaven during the entire tribulation. And the reason for that comes during the, the whole teaching. And we didn't really talk about that in a whole lot of detail. So I want to talk about that a little bit more today. Why is it equated as a wedding? Why is it called the marriage supper of the lamb? Why are we there? Why are we invited? What, what is it that we do immediately following that? We know that we're in heaven before the end of the battle of Armageddon. How does the battle of Armageddon end? Christ returns. It's his second coming. It's the return of the conquering Messiah spoken of in the prophets in the Old Testament. It's the Messiah that the Jewish people thought Jesus was going to be. That's why they... They, when he came in the triumphant entry, they were laying the palm branches and saying, Alleluia, hail to the king, because they thought he was going to come in and kick Rome out and become the conquering Messiah. That's not what he was doing. The first thing the Messiah had to do was suffer and pay for the sin that their sacrifice was a picture of. That was that ultimate sacrifice. That was the suffering Messiah that God said in the book of Genesis to the devil, he will, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. That was the suffering the, the Messiah had to do, was what he did in his first coming. So his second coming is the end of the tribulation, ends the battle of Armageddon, all the prophets talk about it, all the prophets give details about it, and we read about it in chapter 19. But when the door is open, and this is in verse 11, when the door is open, the time has come, Israel's surrounded. It's looking very dire for her. The doors are open and Jesus leaves riding a white horse and all those people that were with him 
clothed in white linen, fine and clean, talking about the saints at the marriage, they come with him. See, heaven is closed. Heaven is closed until, for Jesus to return, until it's time and his father says, go. Okay? And so the doors open, Jesus comes, who's with him? We are. This is why I'm pre-trib. The biggest reason, right here. This is my biggest argument, is the time frame and succession and the specific nature of what John is trying to get across. But why? Why is the wedding so important? Because in the New Testament, throughout the New Testament, wedding language is constantly used when it talks about Jesus and his relationship to the church. And I'm going to read a bunch of these. If you want, write them down. You're not going to have time to, to uh, write them down or r turn to them. So write them down or watch this again on video and you can write them down then. First, and this, by the way, is how a traditional Jewish wedding would run from start to finish during the time of Christ. Okay? Things have changed a little bit because Israel has been scattered and reunited, and during that scattering, they couldn't follow their traditions like they could then. So when Scripture was written, when John wrote Revelation, when Christ was alive, this is exactly how a Jewish wedding or courtship would take place. Okay, here we go. And when you hear this, when you see this, I think you're going to get a better picture of our relationship with Christ. First, the bride is, is selected. The betrothal process begins. John 15, 16. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatever, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. It's interesting, Jesus says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And once the bride is chosen, then the arrangement is made, and a bride price or redemption price is set. Whenever either the parents or the groom would choose the bride, and nine times out of ten, the parents did the choosing back then. Love had no factor in it at all from the standpoint of the groom to the husband at all. Now you might say, boy, that's sexist. Yeah, it was, but that's the way it happened. That's the way it ran. And then once the husband or the bridegroom decided that, or the parents decided that was the bride, then they would come up with a price. They had to buy the bridegroom from the parents. Okay. It's called a dowry today. All right. 1 Corinthians 6.20, For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. When, when a Jew reading that would have read it, that's exactly what they would have thought of. You were bought with a price. You're his bride. You belong to him. The wedding or the, or the bride price or the redemption price was set. 1 Peter 1.18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The marriage contract is then offered. They come up with a contract, okay? In other words, the, the husband would say, I will go to make a place and I will return. And you will be paid what I promised you'll be paid for redemption, for salvation of that bride, to leave that household and become his bride. So Matthew 26, for this, and he did this in the Last Supper. Remember when I said the Last Supper is all wedding language? It's also wedding language. It's not just wedding language, but the actions that he performed were also actions that would be viewed from the disciples as a bridegroom with his bride. When he took the cup and said, this is my blood of the new covenant, 
What's the new covenant? You no longer under law. You no longer have to perform sacrifice. I will pay that price for you. This is my blood. This is paying for it. This is the covenant I have with my church. There's no more paradise. Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you will be, I will be with you or you will be with me in paradise. And that sacrifice that all those people made when Christ resurrected, they went with them. And now we no longer wait, but we go immediately to heaven to be in his presence as soon as we pass. Why? Because his blood paid for our sin. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to see what I mean by this a little more specifically. Because people will argue. There's some people that say, well, salvation is, is an ongoing thing. Salvation is something that, yes, you are forgiven for your past sin, but then you sin again. And if you sin again, you need to get forgiven again. I mean, you got to get saved again. And then if you sin again, you got to get saved again. And you got to get saved again. And you got to get saved again. And there are scriptures that on face value look like they'd support that. But there's also scriptures on face value that support mid-trib and post-trib. I agree. There's also scriptures that might say, if you just read it and you don't keep digging, there's also scriptures that say that Judas went out and hanged himself. And then another passage, it says, go thou and do likewise. So if you want to take passages of scriptures, pull them out of context, never research, and never understand if they look like they contradict, research until they don't. I don't know why that's such a hard thing to understand. Don't research to try to prove your point. What good is that doing you? You say, Ed, that's easy to say. You, that's all you do is teach your point. That's because I used to be pre-trib. Then I went to, and I don't remember the order, but I went to either mid or post, and I held, and I believe it was mid. No, it was post. I held that for years, years. Then I got to Revelation, and I'm like, this can't be, it can't, it can't. It contradicts too much. And I read Daniel, and I read a lot of the other prophets, and I'm like, no, there's too much contradiction. So it, it has to be mid-trip, and I moved. Why? Because I was reading, I was researching, I was learning as much as I could about this, this topic. Right? So if you have a topic that is that controversial and it contradicts, dig until it doesn't. I guarantee you the Holy Spirit will give you your answer. Now, why is this not important? It's not important because if you get saved, I believe you're saved forever. If you ask the Lord to come into your heart again, <laughs> You're not going to lose your salvation over it. He's not going to say, he's not going to get mad at you because you want to make sure that you're going to heaven to be with him forever. That's just dumb. He doesn't, so what does it hurt me, right? If I keep asking, it doesn't hurt. So if you're mid, post, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you believe you can lose your salvation. It doesn't make you lose your salvation. Am I clear on that? There are certain things. Asking Jesus to forgive you from your sin because of the shedding of his blood to pay for that sin is the only way for salvation. Any other teaching that teaches anything else will send someone to hell. That's something that we'll fight about. But guess what? You will never find a contradiction about that in Scripture. Never. Never. You will never find a contradiction in Scripture over matters that are cut in stone that God is saying, this is it. This is law. Jesus says, this is the new covenant. This is it. My blood. Just like a man in front of his bride with his parents would be sitting at that table with that last cup of wine when Jesus says, I will not drink of this cup again until I do it with you together. Exactly like a bridegroom would say. And he also says it about his body. That would also be part of his payment. Then the consent of the bride. Believe it or not, the bride still had to consent. The parents many times would pick their brides and you'd say, well, that's sexist, that's terrible. It wasn't like the woman didn't have a choice. She could still say yes or no. And so once the bride would consent and you say, oh, well, well, how's that fall into scripture? (laughs) 
If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's our consent. That's our acknowledgement that Christ bled, died, and paid for our sin. And we want to be part of his bride. That's our consent. Do you see how salvation and all of this is just flowing exactly like a groom and a bride? That's a blank page. I didn't, burn, I didn't print a blank page. Where'd that come from? Okay, so. So you could just go ahead and. Yeah. Okay, so the marriage, I'm sorry, the marriage contract was offered. They didn't drink the wine yet. The contract was that the, the covenant or the promise Jesus was saying, this is my blood, I'm going to die. And then he died and he rose from the dead. Once the wife gave the consent, then they would drink the wine together with him, with the family. And that again is in Luke 22, 20. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant, my blood, which is shed for you. Then the bride would receive gifts from the bridegroom. And I like this part of this whole ceremony. The whole time he was gone, she was constantly getting gifts, little presents, little things just to remind her of their love for each other that either would grow one day or they already had, depending on what type of relationship it was at the beginning. But he was constantly giving her stuff. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. He's given us so much. And then every day when, we, when he meets our needs and you say, how in the world's God meet our needs? Man, if you have to ask that question, I feel bad for you. I really do. Let me just share one little story of how God meets needs. I was going through a pretty rough time in my life. And I'm going to try to shrink this story. <laughs> Ed shrinking a story. That's a good one. Anyway, I was having a really rough time. And through circumstances that were beyond my control, my house went into foreclosure. When that happened, uh, I obviously then got behind because when your house is in foreclosure, the particular company that I was using would not accept any payments at all. And so as you're looking for money to pay off this, this gigundous loan that they wanted back, uh, you can't even keep it up to date. So it got to a point where um, long and short of it, the house was both in my mother and my name. She passed away and it just became a gigundous mess. So Finally, it started to get straightened out, but I was behind on my payments and I needed 10 grand to catch up. So the state has a program that they will lend you money that you can pay back in smaller increments. They base it on your income. You pay back as your income is. And that's how that way they keep you from losing your home. I got approved by the state. They're like, great. So I called the mortgage company. They said, okay, that's awesome. We'll send you paperwork. All you need is have Helen sign it. Helen's gone. Helen's died. How <laughs> she can't. Oh, well, the need, we need a death certificate and a copy of her will. Got both of those. Okay, now we just need to know how much you own. Or owe. And so the state sends this mortgage company a letter, says we need a written total on how much he owes so that we can send you a check. Oh, well, we can't release that information unless Helen requests it. Helen has passed away. Well, then we need a death certificate and a copy of her will. Okay, here comes copy number two. So then, okay, do you have the will? Yes. Do you have the death certificate? Yes. Can I have a written copy of what we owe you? No, we cannot release that unless Helen requests it. Long story short, I could never get it. So they foreclosed on the house. They took it. 
I had, I believe it was three weeks before I had, no, it was two months before I had to be out of the house. And I didn't know what to do. I started looking, my kid, I wanted my kids to stay in the same school district. This is back when they were still in school. And so I'm looking and looking and Hempfield Township is expensive. Mm -hmm. And I could afford a thousand bucks a month. And that was if I pushed myself as far as I could go. That's the most I could handle for rent because everything else on top of it. And everything in Hempfield, I mean, 1200 bucks was the cheapest place I could find for a three bedroom. I needed at least three bedroom because I had two kids and myself. And that's, that's the cheapest I could find and it was not in an area that I would want my children to live. And so I said, finally one morning, I'm like, okay, God, I give up. I'm done, this is, you deal with it. This is yours. Got in my car, pulled out of my driveway, drove down my road and in the yard, was a sign for rent. And I turned my head and I little, this was my reaction. I, and to this day, it makes me laugh. I looked at that house, I'm like, yeah. And I kept driving. Because I had looked at houses like that in that neighborhood and they were 15 to 18 to two grand a month. It was huge. Two story, huge yard, fenced in backyard. Oh, by the way, I also have a dog. And it's, it's a red lab, so it's not a little dog. They, they make messes, so that was another problem. So this, long story short now, I hear, didn't hear, but I felt this voice in my head say, call him. I'm like, yeah, call him. It was like, it wasn't loud, but it was just this feeling. Literally, I had to put my foot on the brake, turned the car around, went back, wrote the phone number down, called on my way to work. Girl answers, asked about the house on Tippy Canoe. She said, yeah, that one just opened up. She said, we just put the sign out there this morning. This was three hours later, probably, if even that. And I said, well, how much is it? I didn't tell her how much I could afford. She goes, well, he was getting 14. He's thinking of 16 for the new people, she said. And I said, well, that's way out of my price range. She said, well, why don't you just take a look at it? It might change your mind. And I started laughing on the phone. I said, well, I could change my mind. That's not going to change my checkbook, right? I might love it, but that's not going to change what I can afford. And I heard this voice, not here. I, keep, I don't hear voices in my head, okay? <laughs> but I felt this pulling of the Holy Spirit saying, go look at it. I thought, well, what could it hurt? And I said, well, I'm free at 10 o'clock. I, I happened to be in that neighborhood that day. I delivered for Schwann's. That's what I used to do. And so I said, I can meet you at 10. So she said, great. 10 o'clock, we show up. All kinds of things happen. The old guy's still there getting stuff out. I got a chance to talk to him, find out what a phenomenal landlord it is, blah, blah. I'm like, I'm sick to my stomach because I'm thinking, I can't afford this. It had four bedrooms. The master bedroom is a master suite, which I've never had in my life. Full basement with a beautiful laundry room, two car garage, electric garage door openers, new furnace, new, new um, air conditioner, thank you. Just beautiful, brand new carpets. Everything was freshly painted. It was just amazing, right? And I'm like, I'm thinking, God, you're just cruel. You're just mean. <laughs> Why are you doing it? Because I'm, I'm like, I'm ready to live in the gutter at this point, right? And I'm thinking, there's no way I can afford this place. And so I told her, I said, you're way out of my price range. I said, the only thing I could offer, and, and again, I believe this was the Holy Spirit. But I said, the only thing I can offer is I want a long-term lease. I'm willing to go up to six years if he wants to do that, which a lot of landlords like if they get good tenants. So she goes, okay, she says, here's, the, here's an application, uh, fill it out, and I'll have Tim call you. I'm like, Lord, <laughs> this is, why are you doing this to me? Literally. So I filled it out, and I get to the part where it says it costs $450 for a background check, non-refundable. I literally had $462 in my bank. That's a made up number. I don't remember exact. I remember it was like 10 to $15 more than 450. It was gonna to totally empty my account. 
And I was like, man, Lord, I don't even, I don't want to lose this money. I don't want to lose this money. I need this money. This is how I was going to buy groceries this month. If I don't keep this money, my kids don't eat. That's when you decide, do I believe God or not? Do I trust him or not? Now, had this been all me, like I drive by and I look and go, oh, I want to live there, and the Holy Spirit starts laughing, then you don't pursue it, <laughs> okay? But when it's the opposite way around, when you don't really believe that, that you're supposed to have this because it's too nice for you, it's too good, and the Holy Spirit's the one saying, pursue this. Do you have faith or not? So I wrote the check, and I said, all right, it's in your hands, Lord. If he calls me, I'll see him. He called me. <laughs> and he said, I understand you're interested in the house on Tippy Canoe. And I said, yeah. I said, it's out of my price range, but I live at 104 Tippy Canoe, and it would be an easy move, and, you know, he goes, oh, so you own a house? I said, yeah. I said, I have for 30 years. And I told him, not 30 years. I had for, I don't remember, 14 years, 15, something like that. And I said, and uh, these are the circumstances. I told him what happened. I figured honesty is the best policy. Just told him everything. He said, man, is that a terrible break? He says, well, he says, I'm free tonight. He says, if you want to meet after work. He said, I said, I work for Schwann's. I work late. He said, I own a construction company. So do I. So we met at 8 o'clock, which actually was kind of early for me. So we meet at 8 o'clock. He forgot his keys. He says, we can't go in because I forgot my keys. I said, that's okay. I already saw it. So we're sitting in his truck in the driveway. And my prayer through this whole thing was when it started, when I started looking for houses and I couldn't find anything, I kept praying, Lord, just let it be as little change as possible for these kids. They've already gone through enough. I want this to be as little change as possible. So we're sitting in this driveway. We're going through it. And he's reading my, my, uh, my application. And he gets to my references. And he goes, oh, you know pastor such and such. I'm not going to name names because I didn't ask if that was OK. And I said, yeah, he's my pastor. He goes, oh. He go, and I said, yeah, we're kind of related. His son married my niece. And he goes, oh, you mean Kevin and Jenny. <laughs> now I can say first names. I said, yeah, Jenny's my niece. He goes, really? So you know Bob? I said, yeah, Bob's my brother-in-law. Sherry's my sister. I know Bob and Sherry. <laughs> he goes, these are good people. He said, in fact, the church, we just did their, they, we did a big lounge, like uh, pre-church coffee shop thing, whatever. And he built it for them. It was beautiful. He said, I just built their, their uh, coffee shop. He said, they're good people. Now I'm working over at Jenny and Kevin's house. We're doing additions or re re renovations, whatever. He said, great people. He, he took the check that I handed him. He said, if you know these people, I don't need this. And he ripped it up. <laughs> Praise God. Every time I even think of this, this happens. <laughs> he said, and I'll make a deal with you. He said, if it's too expensive, I know you own a home, so you know what it's like to take care of a house. If you're responsible for the yard and you're responsible for the appliances and you fix things when they need fixed, he says, major stuff, siding, roof, stuff like that, I'll take care of. He said, but if you'll do everything that you said you could do, I'll give it to you for $1,050 a month. Praise God. And in my mind, I heard the Lord say, you'll just have to have faith for that extra 50. Amen. And I said, I got a problem. He said, what's that? He wanted first month, last month, security deposit, right? I said, I didn't realize that I was going to get a house as fast. I don't have anything to pay you for a security deposit. He said, well, he says, it's going to take about a month to move in, so why don't we sign the lease, post-date it for a month, let you save up, you pay me what you can, and then just pay a little extra each month until you pay it off, until you're caught up. What landlord does that? No. I've never met one. one led by the Spirit. God gives us gifts. Yes. Yeah. 
Just like the bridegroom gives his wife to be gifts. Throughout that betrothal period, throughout that time, he's constantly reminding his wife-to-be, I love you. I am coming for you. I promise I'm coming for you. This is just a little taste of what you're going to get. Then the bride is washed or sanctified. This is a sanctification process that a bride would go through. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your, wife, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but, the, but she should be holy and without blemish. Again, I hear people that say that God's blood only forgives us for a certain period of time. That it's not good enough for future sin. It's only good enough for past sin. That we have to be perfect after that. Let me ask you something. When you ask Jesus for forgiveness again, what cleanses that sin? None of us would argue that it's his blood. So why are you limiting the power of his blood to be temporary? Because the bride, once she's sanctified, guess what? Doesn't have to do it again and again and again and again and again. She was cleansed once. It was a ceremonial cleansing. It wasn't a physical, oh, I'm dirty, I need to take a bath. It was a ceremonial cleansing that she's worthy to be this man's bride. And the only way that we are worthy to be the bride of Christ is through the cleansing of his blood. And Paul tells us that in Ephesians and Corinthians. And he uses Jewish traditional wedding speak so that people would understand this is a one-time thing. And once you're cleansed, then you're ready, then you're sanctified, then you can become his bride. Is it starting to make sense now? Then the bridegroom, prepare, or the bridegroom prepares a place for his bride in his father's house. John 14, 2 through 3. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Wow, if that's not right out of the Jewish wedding handbook, I don't know what it is. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there ye may be also. The exact words spoken by a bridegroom to his bride before he would come and get her. Okay? Let's keep going. Because I don't even know what time it is. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay. Uh, the re return of the bridegroom for the bride. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 17. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring him with those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Listen to these words, people. Listen to these words. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. A shout with the voice of an archangel. For, and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first then we which who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be with the Lord. Always. Never separated again. Now, let's just keep going. The procession then back to the Father's house. And this is interesting, because when the groom comes to get the bride, guess what? 
They don't stay where she's at. Why? Because he prepared a place for her. And when they come and get her, guess what? It's a pretty big celebration. It's pretty good news. And they have a pretty loud procession back to the father's house. Back to the wedding supper. Days. For how long? One week. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Lord. You can't be that obvious and have us miss it that bad for thousands of years. Wait a minute. How long was the wedding supper of a Jewish marriage? One week. How many weeks did Daniel give to, to, to Dan, or Gabriel, or God give to Daniel? 70 weeks. How many have been spent? 69. How many are left? One week. How long is the tribulation? Hmm, one week. Do you get it yet? One week, they would go back to the father's house and they would celebrate the union of the bride and the groom. And it was nothing but a party. They didn't go and fight off the wives, former enemies. They didn't do that. They left. They went to the father's house and they celebrated. And we are told, and this is what I love. <laughs> Let's just look at it. Turn back to Revelation 19, verse 6. Now read it, knowing what a Jewish person reading this would know. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the voice of many waters and the voice of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. What would a Jew think? We're about to have seven days or seven years of celebration. The marriage supper has come. Remember how John is seeing everything. John is looking from heaven at earth and heaven, and he sees it all. He sees temporal things happening down here and non-temporal things happening up here. He's not stuck in time anymore. So maybe he had a little bit of an understanding more certainly than we do of what it means to be in eternity, but yet there's still a temporal thing going and he's trying to explain all this stuff going on. And what he's trying to equate to them is the same language that Christ gave to them in the Last Supper, the same language the Holy Spirit gives Paul throughout the epistles, the same language that Christ used whenever he talks about reuniting with the church, with his bride, and he assumes in this that every person who's reading this, which remember, the church is mainly made up of Jews at this point. The bulk of the church is still Jewish people. That's the bulk of it. There'd be very few Gentiles reading this at the time. So his knowledge and the Holy Spirit is also saying, think about it from the Holy Spirit's point of view. Nobody that's going to read this original letter is going to be alive at the end times. Nobody. So they don't have to understand this. Who's that sound like? Daniel. Well, I don't understand it. Daniel, you don't have to understand it. They'll be unsealed at the end for those alive at the end. People, do you know how special you are? You're seeing these things be revealed. We're understanding Scripture now more clear than we've ever understood it before, a lot of which is end-time teaching because we're told in the end it'll be revealed. And so maybe it wasn't just set in stone. Why? Because it didn't have to be. But they would understand, and we living in this time can look at the signs. We can understand the meaning of the birth pains. We see them growing. We've seen Israel become a nation again. And I stress that because I don't think anybody 
realizes, including myself, how huge and difficult that was and what it took and, the, and the, just the, the working of God to enable that to happen. And we saw that as we did our study through God's dealing with Israel in this very class. If you don't remember it, go back and watch it. If you didn't see it, go back and watch it. Personally, that's like six months worth of teaching, and I think it's the biggest, most important part of this teaching because it helps you understand he never stopped dealing with people. We might think he did, and we might live like he did, but he has never stopped dealing with people. We are his creation, and he loves us. And it says right here, and John knows the bulk of people are Jews. When I say the marriage of the Lamb is come, they are going to understand after everything I've just written, after everything Jesus said, after everything that Paul has written in his epistles, if you put it all together, it fixes the puzzle and shows you this is Christ's marriage to his church it lasts a week of celebration. The bride never, ever stayed at the bride's house. He took her immediately to heaven to stay seven days for a celebration, which is the time length of the tribulation. According to Daniel, seven days equaling, equaling a week, which we see throughout the writing of Revelation correlates how we know it's Daniel's 70th week. To me, it's crystal clear. To me, it's like, it's beyond obvious, but you're not me, so maybe it's not. So call me, ask me, text me if you have questions. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. That's that sanctification part that we were talking about. We were cleansed to be worthy to be that bride. And he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed are they. Why? Because they're escaping the wrath to come. We're promised that by Jesus, by John, by Paul, by many different prophets in the Old Testament that followers of God will escape the wrath to come just like his bride would. Now let's go down to verse 11. And I saw heaven opened. Behold a white horse. Now, what do you mean he saw heaven open? The seventh seal talks about being, and I'm sorry this is going over, but I am not going to end this thought here. The seventh seal or bowl judgment is poured on the earth. And part of that is the angel, what angel? Archangel. Archangel coming and saying what? It is done. Right? Then Jesus comes, followed by who? Us, the bride, the church. We follow him, and we'll see what happens next week. How's that for a cliffhanger? <laughs> Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for leading, guiding, directing, and teaching us. And we pray, Lord, that you would help this to fire us up, Lord, to want to serve you more and stronger. Lord, we don't have much time. And I don't know what else you have to do to show us that. I don't know what else we have to see. I don't know how many more signs have to become more obvious. Wake us up. Because, Lord, there's millions, there's billions of people that are on their way to hell. Lord, there's only one way to escape it. And I don't blame them for not wanting it. Because, Lord, the church hasn't shown them much. But it's not too late, because we're still here. We still have your power. We still have your promises. But we have to claim them, and we have to live them. Father, help us to learn your love. In Jesus' name, amen.